met Jeff already this week. And, um, you know, with FDR, there's so much there to examine and there's a lots of to relate it to the constitution as well. And, it's, and in particular, this topic has become even, you know, it's always very timely and appropriate, but it seems like 2020 and 2021 um, treatment of Asian Americans in our society has really come under the spotlight. And you often see references to Japanese internment as part of that discussion now. So I asked Jeff, he would uh, deal with this with us this afternoon. And I'm just seeing links come in as, as I'm talking, it's a little distracting. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff to talk about FDR and Japanese internment. Thanks again, Jeff, for participating and to agreeing to do, I believe three presentations. You do another one tomorrow morning. So mm -hmm. we appreciate it as always and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, it's always a pleasure to work with you, Mark uh, and Therese. And of course you guys always attract the most awesome educators. So how could you possibly go wrong? Um, so thanks for coming back, everybody. Um, today we're talking about uh, the Japanese American internment. And as Mark said, this is one of these things that just you know um, constantly has uh, new relevance uh, all the time. What I'd like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about um, the background uh, of this and um, give you some insight as to um, how this actually all unfolded and happened and, and you know, kind of came down, <clears throat> came down the pipe. In my opinion, it's often mis, uh, mistaught um, and maybe even a little bit misrepresented in terms of um, you know, how the whole thing uh, came about. It clearly, clearly, no doubt about it, is one of the biggest blemishes on the Roosevelt uh, record. Um, there was a, it was a mistake in, in how it was implemented. Um, and um, we'll, get a little, we'll get a little bit into that, but it certainly uh, is one of those things that stands out as a highlight of FDR, what were you thinking? Um, you know, right up there uh, with, the, uh, with the court packing. So, you know, if, you know the theme of this is, is constitution, but you know, almost the theme could almost be, you know, hey president, what were you thinking when you did this kind of thing? So, um, so that's the attitude and the, and the approach that we're going to take a look at. This was clearly um, not a, a, a smart thing for FDR to do in terms of, um, you know, as we look back on it now. Um, however, it may have been a smart thing to do in terms of the context of, of when he did it. So um, I'll let you guys uh, make that call on your own. But I just want to start off by saying that, you know, it clearly is recognizably one of uh, FDR's biggest uh, blemishes on his record. In order to understand the Japanese American um, internment, and I just want to, before we go any further with that, the, the, the term internment is now beginning to be questioned as to whether or not um, that really should be the word uh, to be used. Um, and there's, there's um, that's the word that everybody's been using for years and years and years, but supposedly there's some kind of a legal definition to some of these things. And so um, the idea is that, um, you know, we're trying to, we're beginning to move away from uh, internment and think of it really more as an incarceration. Um, and there's legal uh, definitions that uh, they get into each of that. So if you're using internment for the time being, you're okay, but just be aware that there's likely to be somebody that's gonna stand up and say, hey, wasn't it more of an incarceration? Uh, and if that's the case, then you can, you know, we're warned it's more armed. Now, in order to understand this, um, this executive order, that led to um, the internment of these, you know, 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans. We need to back up a couple of months, um, and this is what I say when I say that this is very often uh, kind of misrepresented. You know, it's it's it very often presented as if FDR woke up one day and said, "Hey, you know what? Might be kind of fun, um, you know, uh, interning uh, 120,000 Japanese Americans." That's not what happened. Um, the way it worked was we have to go back to the attack um, actually at, uh, at Pearl Harbor and understand the context under which FDR was, uh, was operating uh, and, uh, and working. So let's go back to December 7th, 1941, uh, when there's this massive surprise attack on uh, the, the military forces of the, uh, of the United States. Um, the United States had lulled itself into this false sense of security thinking that we are protected by these two oceans. Yeah, stuff goes on in Europe, stuff goes on in Asia. But, you know, we, we've got these two vast oceans that are going to keep us pretty safe 
and pretty, um, you know, okay in the event anything goes uh, goes down. And that was shattered on um, December seventh, um, nineteen forty-one. Very much like our, um, you know, attitude of it can't happen here was shattered on um, September eleventh, two thousand and one. So it's a Sunday morning, beautiful Sunday morning in uh, Pearl Harbor, and uh, the Japanese uh, have this uh, this attack. Uh, it is a surprise attack. Um, it is a surprise attack on the largest military base the United States has outside um, of the, uh, the United States. And um, while this is happening, um, Japanese diplomats are in Washington, D.C., negotiating with the president, with the State Department, to sort of ease down tensions, right? Things are getting, you know, um, you know, kind of tense. They were heating up. And the Japanese diplomats were negotiating with us to try to, let's back things down here before anything gets um, too hot and too crazy. Um, and um, so that was, you know, uh, also part of the context of this. Um, and of course, on that morning, more than 2,000 people were killed, um, you know, without warning, without provocation. Um, it was just, um, you know, not a, not a good thing. So the surprise of this cannot be underscored enough. We thought we were protected by oceans. It was the largest military base we had outside of the United States. We had put it there basically to project power into the Pacific Rim, thereby hopefully scaring the Japanese into behaving uh, or certainly negotiating, uh, which they were doing. So it seemed to be working. And then um, you know, to have this attack uh, occur and to have it occur uh, with such a, a high cost, you know, 2000 uh, people um, was was really a shock, and that's what had taken over the mindset uh, in the country and in Washington. Keep in mind, also at this time, the world is going to hell, right? Um, you know, the Nazis are all over Europe. Uh, France has been defeated. England is barely holding on. Um, Italy is in North uh, Africa, and of course, they are allied uh, with the Nazis. Um, and Japan has been sweeping across the Pacific Rim uh, into China. Uh, into other territories there. What are they looking for? They're looking for um, resources. Uh, they're looking for um, raw material. And I happen to have here a Japanese uh, army helmet from World War II about this time. Um, they had taken to creating um, army helmets out of bamboo uh, because we had stopped selling steel to them over the summertime. Um, which led up to the attack at Pearl Harbor, and they needed to get, uh, they felt they needed to get these resources. So, you know, um, these are, this is kind of the context that's going on behind this. And please remember, this is by no means, um, uh, am I making an excuse for what occurred with this uh, Japanese uh, American internment, but um, it is, um, uh, I do want to create the context. The Pearl Harbor situation was a huge, American miscalculation. Um, the United States was ranked somewhere between uh, uh, 14 and 17 behind Portugal in military strength on the morning of December 7th. So, um, you know, we really were uh, not ready to get into a war. We put all of our eggs in this one basket by trying to create this super base out there in the Pacific to project power into the Pacific Rim. The way I always explain it to students is it's kind of like when you're in elementary school and you got the lunch lady, right? You know, you're goofing around at lunch and then all of a sudden the lunch lady walks by and then all of a sudden you're not goofing around. And then she gets over a couple of tables and you start goofing around again. That's kind of what this base at uh, Pearl Harbor was supposed to do. It was supposed to be like the big lunch lady out there in the Pacific Rim to get the Japanese um, to behave and or uh, negotiate. And so when this attack occurred on, on Pearl Harbor, um, there was a lot of egg on a lot of people's faces. Um, you know, why did this happen? Why was it a surprise? Why was it so successful? Uh, who was at fault? And of course the army blamed the Navy and the Navy blamed the army. And you had uh, both of these folks out there on that island. And there was a lot of miscommunication as to who was actually in charge, um, who was actually supposed to be um, having the, uh, you know, the upper hand in terms of, of how things were run out there. Um, they did not coordinate their efforts to the point where, um, you know, an army, and, I, and forgive me if this is wrong, I can never keep them straight, but let's say the army's low um, alert rate was a three and the Navy's high alert rate was a three. So they couldn't even get those two things, you know, uh, coordinated and such. And um, 
there was a really, um, you know, a, a, there was an accident waiting to happen, you know, uh, really is what it was. There was also a lot of anti-Asian sentiment on the West Coast. Um, there had been resentment on the, about the Japanese going back, um, you know, many, many years. Uh, it was a classic case of, um, you know, foreigners coming in and doing better than the locals. Um, the Japanese had come in and had done uh, great success in business, particularly in the uh, citrus industry, the trucking industry, and the shipping industry. Um, and there was a lot of resentment from the local folks on the West Coast. You know, here, here these guys are coming in and they're doing better than us. We've been here forever. So there was a lot of that. Um, the, um, the politicians on the West Coast stirred up a lot of this uh, in order to um, gain political support. So they were um, seeing this anti-Asian sentiment and they were in fact stirring it up you know, hey, you know, vote for me, you know, elect me and we'll take care of these guys. I know what you're talking about. So there was a lot of that that was going on there as well. And um, there was a lot of animosity um, toward what was going on out there. So that is sort of a, a background of this. So when the attack at Pearl Harbor um, takes place, we're totally caught off guard and we had thought we had it all figured out and we didn't. And this is what is feeding the mindset of the military. The military, whether they were the army or the navy, and they were both pointing fingers at each other, were completely and totally caught off guard, and they were not going to allow that to happen again. You know, they had literally, you know, um, just been totally caught off guard. You know, caught with their pants down, so to speak, and um, they were super duper um, adamant that this was not going to happen again. That you know, this was not going to uh, occur. And so when you take this anti-Japanese uh, sentiment, uh, anti-Asian sentiment on the West Coast, and then you take this surprise attack uh, at, uh, at Pearl Harbor on the largest base, uh, which, which we thought was secure and safe, and yet we got this huge uh, loss handed to us. Um, this is what was going on in the minds of the, uh, the military. So, um, and of course this happens in December. When the executive order comes out in February um, the following year, so this happens in December, then you have January and half of February before the executive order goes out, the question is what was going on in that intermediate time? And um, it was a, um, it was a, uh, um, it was a, a time in, in Washington that was very tumultuous, of course. Um, you know, I mean, it's an understatement to say that. But the Japanese American uh, internment, this executive order 9066, was not done as a knee jerk reaction. In fact, there were 10 weeks of intense debate um, that was going on in Washington uh, between the Justice Department, the State Department, the War Department, um, and the White House. And um, everybody had a different perspective on, on this as to what we ought to do. Now, the uh, uh, Secretary of War, um, uh, Secretary of War Stimson, you know, he has just had this massive attack, uh, which he should have been able to prevent. You know, I mean, you know, should have, could have. You know, there's a whole we can get into a whole another discussion about you know the the, the problems at, at Pearl Harbor. But the point was, uh, it was a successful attack from the from the standpoint of the Japanese. So he um, and the War Department were not going to let this happen again. So they said, you know what? We have to take whatever measure, whatever drastic measure we have to take. If that's what we've got to do, that's what we have to do. And we've got these Japanese, uh, you know, uh, Americans of, of Japanese ancestry. They're spread all across the West Coast. We don't know, you know, we thought we were cool at, at Pearl Harbor. Now we're talking mainland. We don't know if these guys are a fifth column working with, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Japanese uh, military, we don't know. And we believe that these guys couldn't be trusted, right? Now you had your diplomats right in Washington talking over, um, you know, how to calm things down. And then all of a sudden the, um, the um, uh, Japanese uh, attack. So uh, at the Justice Department, um, Secretary Biddle was saying, you can't do that. You know, we can't just round these guys up. You know, these, uh, we have to catch people that were involved in something and then send them through due process. We can't just wholesalely round up um, an entire group of people because, um, you know, a country attacked us. You know, it's not something that we can do. We cannot do it uh, constitutionally. We have these, these, um, we have these, um, 
you know, due process procedures that need to be followed and they need to be uh, addressed. However, you know, terrible the situation is, we, we can't throw that out, uh, out the window. And of course, um, over at uh, the FBI, the FBI, and this is quite, kind of interesting, um, J. Edgar Hoover, of course, at the FBI, uh, he had been keeping an eye on um, various folks uh, in the country that he thought were likely to be troublemakers. And so um, I have a memo here from the FBI and he sends this uh, to the secretary for the president. And it says, uh, dear General Watson, I thought it might be of interest to the president uh, and you to have the enclosed charts before you, which show the number of Japanese, German and Italian aliens taken into custody by the FBI as of December 9th. So within 48 hours of the attack at Pearl Harbor. This gives the exact location of the numbers apprehended and the places at which they were apprehended. Sincerely yours, J. Edgar Hoover. And so here is that, uh, that document here. So what Hoover does is he sends this, this memo to the president's secretary. And what he's basically saying is, don't worry, I got it all under control. I've been keeping an eye on these guys, right? You can argue whether that was constitutional or not, but I've been keeping an eye on the most troublemaking uh, types of folks that are likely to occur. And I'm sending you these three charts. And so here is uh, one of them. This is um, the chart for Jap chart, excuse me, for Japanese Americans. You can see there's huge numbers of Japanese, 113, 30, uh, 86, 328, uh, 23 along the East Coast here. Okay, then you've got some down here uh, in the, the uh, Texas area. And then there were a bunch that were rounded up up here uh, in uh, the Northeast. And what Hoover is basically saying, what's interesting about this is, this is within 48 hours, 7.30 uh, a.m., December 9th, 1941, 1,212 Japanese aliens picked up, rounded up, and are now in FBI custody. So what Hoover's saying is, these were the folks that we suspect might be involved in something. If there's going to be, it's kind of like, you know how there's like that one family in your, in your neighborhood that whenever something goes down, the police go right to that house because they know that's probably the family, you know, somebody in that family probably caused that problem in the town, um, right? That's how Hoover was looking at um, these folks that he had rounded up uh, here. He also sent a chart that showed 620 Germans. Now, the 620 Germans uh, were concentrated up here in the Northeast, which of course, if you know your, your, you know your migration patterns and such makes perfect sense, weren't too many out here. But notice it's only half the number of the Japanese Americans that uh, Hoover is taken into custody and uh, taken a look at. And then the next batch are the um, Italians. And there are only 98 Italians uh, that are uh, taken into custody across the way here uh, as well. So what you see from this is that, um, you know, by half, again, the number of uh, folks that were rounded up were of Asian uh, <coughs> ancestry. So Hoover's basically pro providing in the argument, you don't have to do anything more. I've got the troublemakers. The military is saying, you can't trust that you got everybody. You know, look what happened. You know, we thought we had everything under control at Pearl Harbor, but now look what happened there. We have to do something. We have to do something. The State Department is saying no. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Justice Department is saying no. We can't do anything. These people have not uh, created a, a crime. They've not committed a crime. If we find somebody throwing dynamite into a, you know, a, a munitions factory or something like that, then you arrest them, then you put them through due process. But until then, they haven't done anything wrong. And the State Department was just kind of scratching its head saying, gee, you know, we're not really sure what to do. Um, you know, we were being negotiated with by the diplomats, but we couldn't trust them. But on the same token, you know, we can't just, you know, the, the, the Justice Department's right. You can't just go rounding these people up. But then again, the military's right, because they were the guys, um, you know, that, that thought everything was under control and they weren't able to have it under control. And this is the debate that went back and forth in the, um, in the Capitol um, from um, shortly after the attack on December 7th, right within 48 hours, Hoover's got these guys rounded up, uh, up until the actual issuance of uh, the executive order uh, 9066. So what basically happened with this, and this is where it's gonna sound like a really big you know, FDR excuse, 
and I don't mean it to be, but it's the reality is. So FDR is weighing all this stuff. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind, let's get another little piece of, of context. He thinks we're not going to, you know, he's trying everything he can to stay out of the war, right? Despite, you know, people say, oh, you're trying to get us into the war. He's trying to prepare for the war, but he's also trying to stay out of it, right? He's walking this fine line uh, as, uh, as the months uh, and year and a half leading up to the attack at Pearl Harbor uh, uh, takes place. Now, all of a sudden, there's this attack. It is not only an attack against the American military, it's an attack against the Navy, right? Primarily the Navy. FDR is a Navy man. FDR loves the Navy, right? So if you are going to, you know, really, it, it, it was like an adding insult to injury. It was bad enough you attacked our country. It was bad enough you attacked, you know, um, and killed our military personnel, but you attacked my favorite branch. Um, you know, so now he's really riled up about uh, that as well, and as of course he would be even if it had been the army. But uh, it was it was really it really hit home with FDR. In fact, many of the ships that were destroyed at at uh, Pearl Harbor, FDR had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy when the kilns for those uh, those ships were laid, uh, and he is in fact there at, at many of the um, you know the laying of the of the of the keel uh, for those uh, for those ships. So he's got that going on. Three days after the attack at Pearl Harbor, uh, Adolf Hitler declares war on the United States. So now we're not just in a war with Japan, we are also in a war with uh, Adolf Hitler. This is the war that FDR really wanted to fight. This was the war, he saw Hitler as a huge threat to uh, world you know, peace and, and domination. And of course he was right. However, after the attack at Pearl Harbor, everybody, was galvanized in support of fighting the Japanese, which was not the war that FDR really wanted uh, uh, to be in. First of all, our, our fleet had just been you know, severely handicapped, AKA nearly destroyed. Secondly, it, uh, you know, it was a huge, vast area. Europe was much uh, tighter, much closer, much smaller, um, and had this bigger threat, you know, this recognizable threat uh, in terms of Adolf Hitler. So this is the stuff that's going on in the mind of, of FDR and the stuff that's going on in the mind uh, of the leaders in, in Washington. So what FDR does is he creates something of a compromise. And the compromise is Executive Order 9066. Right? And there's a copy of it right here. And that little old FDR's signature on there, okay? And if you read this document, and, um, and I'm sure you will, what this basically says is the FDR creates sort of a compromise. So all right, State Department says they don't know what's going on. Justice Department says um, you know, that we really can't arrest people until they've been proven to, or not proven, but really suspected of having actually done something. We can't just arrest these guys based upon the fact that their grandma you know, lives in, uh, in Japan. The uh, War Department says we better do something and we better do it fast. And the politicians on the West Coast are beating the drum to do something as well because they have been making a career out of um, fomenting this anti-Japanese sentiment. Now they've got the perfect excuse to really begin to move uh, forward with this, right? Look what they did at Pearl Harbor. If they could do it there, they could do it here. And you know how we've been feeling about these guys for the last 15 or 20 years. See, we were right, here it is, let's do something. So this is the pressure that's bearing down on the president. He doesn't quite buy any of the arguments 100%. So what he decides to do is issue executive order uh, 9066. And if you read this order carefully, what it says is the president allows the military to create, he gives the military the power to create exclusion zones, okay? So what 9066 does is it gives the military the power and the right to create exclusion zones. Now, in the mind of FDR, an exclusion zone would be around a port, around a you know, seaport, around an airport, around train terminals, around factories that are uh, important to munitions uh, manufacturing, around communication centers, around um, uh, you know, energy sources, you know, dams, rivers, um, you know, um, electrical facilities, those sorts of things. In FDR's mind, when he says it create an exclusion zone, he's thinking of it around 
a particular target or a particular threat or a particular uh, you know, physical, tangible um, facility. But that's not what it says. It says you have a right to create exclusion zones. So the military reads this and says, really? We have a right to create exclusion zones? And you know, everybody says, yeah, that's what this order says, that you could create an exclusion zone. So the military says, okay, then that's what we'll do. And they created basically two exclusion zones. One of those exclusion zones, boys and girls, was the entire west coast of the United States. All right, so not seaports, not airports, not rail lines, not overpasses, not uh, you know munition factories and those sorts of things, but exclusion zone all the way across the entire uh, west coast. The other exclusion zone was down here in the southern part uh, of the United States as well. So the, the law says we can make an exclusion zone. I know what we'll do is we will create two exclusion zones, and that's how this whole thing. Uh, came about. Um, and the idea, again, was to keep people out of areas, not take people out of areas, uh, in terms of what the executive order um, was, uh, was all about. Um, not that two rights make a wrong, uh, no, two wrongs make a right, rather, not that two, right, is that the way it goes? Yeah, not that two wrongs make a right, but Canada and other Southern um, uh, South American countries also um, did some of this uh, internment stuff um, as well. So it wasn't like it was unprecedented. Uh, it certainly wasn't, you know, right, but it wasn't like it was unprecedented. And in the minds of FD, in the mind of FDR, it was let's keep these guys out of this this area. By the time this whole thing began, by the time the military took action on this, um, FDR is in a global war on two fronts, and the United States has been attacked. We are um, anywhere from 14 to 17, I've seen both numbers behind Portugal in military strength. And he feels as if I've, I've issued the executive order, you know, I've, I've already kind of taken care of that problem. He's got a hundred other things that he needs to uh, take care of. Again, I'm not making excuses. I'm laying out what the, uh, the reality was, what the context of this thing was. Now, could he have gone back and said, whoa, military, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, yes, he could have done that. Um, didn't he do that? No. Why didn't he do that? Well, he was very busy with other sorts of things like trying to fight a two front war. Um, he also um, wanted to not undercut the military. You know, okay, you guys, you know, because he was sensitive to what they had just been through with the uh, tremendous embarrassment, um, to say the least, of the uh, attack uh, at Pearl Harbor. And so what went out was um, this idea of, um, <clears throat> of rounding up Japanese Americans. So here is a poster, uh, you know, instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry. Basically, they were given anywhere from 48 hours to a week to pack up their stuff and get out. So if you had a house and, um, you know, you were living out there and you had that Japanese ancestry, um, the, uh, this executive order, you know, operated on through the military, basically said, you gotta get out of here. So you got a week to sell your house, get rid of your stuff, find somebody to take care of your cat while you're gone. And we're getting you out of here and we're taking you out of um, uh, these areas. And what happened was um, these folks were picked up, taken away and were uh, <coughs> put into these uh, internment camps. Now, this will give you an idea of how horrible a situation some of this stuff was, right? So here are ordinary, everyday, ordinary Americans who happen to have some Japanese ancestry. I love this little guy, right? Look, I mean, talk about, you know, how sad is that, right? And they're in the back of a truck. The truck has been sealed up with a rope, basically, okay? And they're being hauled off to these internment camps. Now, not everybody went in the back of a truck, but some people did. So it'll give you an idea of, of how that worked. This is my favorite picture of the period because it says a lot in this picture. This picture is worth its weight in gold in terms of, of what it says. So basically, this is a train, and these are Japanese Americans who have um, complied with the order, and they have now gone down to the train station. They're going to load onto this train, and they're going to be taken off 
to these uh, centers. Now, what's interesting about this is this. Look at these folks, right? They're dressed to the nines. They look like they're going to church, right? Or a wedding or, you know, the opening of a dollar store or something, right? That's, that's how I always dress when the dollar store opens because um, I get a lot of good like anniversary gifts from my wife there. Um, so here's the thing, um, and I'm still married. Uh, so um, here's the way this works. This uh, are people who are taking this and they're saying, okay, you know what? You can take me out of my home. You can force me to sell my home. You can force me to sell my business, but you're not taking away my dignity. I will go, but I'm gonna go looking good, all right? You're not gonna pull me out of here in cuffs. I'll go, but I'm gonna go looking good. This was the, um, the attitude of the Japanese uh, Americans. There were really uh, very, there was very, 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 very little resistance put up. Um, you know, these guys didn't shoot at the, you know, the agents when they came and knocked on the door and said, you know, you've got to go. These were people who said, you know what, if the government thinks that we need to do this to keep America safe, to keep America strong, I don't like it, but I'm going to do it because this is what my government is telling me to do. So that's one part of the story you can read. The other part of the story is, look who these very well-dressed, dignified people are. They're little old ladies, they're children, they're little old men. Do these look like threats? You know, do these look like the kind of folks that are gonna run down and throw a Molotov cocktail into the local defense industry or, you know, start pulling the, the spikes out of the local railroad uh, thing? No, right? These are, um, you know, ordinary red-blooded Americans who happen to have ancestry uh, from Japan. Um, uh, yeah, Japan. Now, here's the other thing I love about this is look at the manpower here, okay? So this is not like, you know, the January 6th rioters here, folks, right? These are, you know, dignified people who are orderly. They're in line. They've got their stuff. They're getting on. They're looking good. And what do you got here? You've got, if you count this, 18 American military personnel just in this picture. And that doesn't include what's beyond the scope of the picture, right? 18 of these guys. Do you really need that kind of manpower to get these kind of people onto a train, right? Do you really need that kind of manpower? No, you don't. But the military was not taking any chances. So they basically were, you know, overreacting. They were kind of going a bit berserk with this uh, in terms of, look, we're not making anything, anything. we're gonna go overkill. We're gonna overkill, uh, and, and I'm not, let me backtrack, I don't mean the military was berserk, but what I'm saying was that they were, they were over the top in terms of the reaction. We weren't gonna take any chances. We're not gonna have another, um, you know, uh, 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 December 7th, 1941. We're not gonna have another uh, Pearl Harbor. We're gonna do everything we can. And if it means having too many guys here, then that's what we're gonna do. The other thing I love about this picture is not only does it show the dignity of these folks, not only does it show how calm they are, not only does it show the uh, uh, overzealousness uh, of the military to make sure you got enough people here, but look at the helmets they're wearing. They're wearing World War I helmets. So this tells you, right, how far behind we were in our military preparedness. If these folks are such a threat that they have to be removed from their house, if these folks are such a threat that you have to have overwhelming manpower to get them onto a train, don't you think you would be wearing the most modern military equipment? Well, they were for what the American army had at the time, which was World War I outfits. So we were so unprepared for this attack at Pearl Harbor that we were you know, going to war with leftover surplus World War I materials. Um, and I love that picture because it really underscores uh, a lot of that, that sort of stuff. These folks were allowed to pack up one bundle of stuff. And here they are. You got a bundle of stuff and you get to take it to the, uh, to the uh, internment camp. And so here are some folks waiting to, um, to go, right? And again, you know, they're, they're standing, oh, this guy's got his hands on his hip. This guy's leaning here arms crossed, you know, these nice ladies over here looking over at the camera and stuff. You know, these are not militants. These are not rioters. These are not, you know, folks that are going over, over the top. And, <clears throat> excuse me, they were sent 
uh, here's, you know, like I love the, the expression in these, these little boys' face. You know, I mean, look at that, right? What's going on? You know, these guys are perplexed. What's going on? How come I've got to leave my house? How come I've got to leave my friends? What, what did we do? What went wrong? What happened here? You know, and of course, the thing was that it was a, an overreaction based upon this um, 9066. This is where these folks, um, and you know, here's like another example of the, uh, I'll just show you some of these pictures. So here's an old little old guy, you know, getting taken off the train, right? Clearly this guy is no, no threat, right? Either that or he's got a really good disguise. Um, here is, uh, again, what a reception area looks like for this, okay? Uh, now what's interesting about this is you'll notice so here are the barracks back here these guys are going to live in. Here's the trucks driving their bundles in. Here are their bundles. And over here is a little trotting uh, track. So some of these camps were set up on fairgrounds. You know, they were really makeshift. You know, so let's find a place where we got some flat land and we'll stick these, um, these you know, uh, barracks basically up and we'll let these folks move into these things. And that's what they did. The barracks... Here's a great picture of that. Look at this. These barracks here now show uh, it's just the same U.S. government issued barrack one after the other after the other after the other. Completely unlandscaped, completely un, you know, um, you know, recognizable one from the next. You know, if you didn't know what number you were in, you're not going to know where to go back. Um, these buildings were open inside, so um, the they were divided by I think like 20 by 25 foot spaces with uh, clotheslines and blankets and, and you know, tarps. You know, there was no walls, solid walls from one family to the next. Um, you know, they were basically made out of plywood and, and, uh, and uh, tar paper, um, you know, and you had uh, you know, some electric in them. You had a heater, uh, you know, wood stove in there to, to heat things uh, as well. And this is what folks ended up uh, living in uh, during the, um, during the time frame. Here is a little closer view, okay, uh, on here as well. And, um, you know, again, this is it, right? So you go from the house, look up, you know, let's take a minute, run outside of your house, look how nice your house is. Okay, come on back in. And so imagine you're living in that house, which you are, of course, because you're there. And then imagine there's a knock on the door and says, guess what, in a week, you got to be out of here and this is what you're gonna be living in, okay? That's the kind of shock that we're talking about um, with these places, okay? That's the kind of shock that we're talking about in terms of, uh, of this. Imagine you're a young kid and suddenly this is your reality, right? You know, we've been complaining because we've been locked down for 15 months. Uh, imagine you're living in this. Now, what happened in these, in these places? Well, um, what the Japanese Americans that were living in these places did is they made the best of it. Right, they absolutely made the best of it. And um, you know, here are two young guys, right? And they're goofing around out in front of the barracks, right? You can see how stark this is out here, but you know, they're happy, you know, or at least they're trying to be happy, or they're as happy as they can be given the situation that they're in. You know, these guys, you know, felt like, hey, this is what America needs me to do. We're gonna do this. And why are we gonna do this? Because we're red-blooded Americans, and that's what we think should happen. Here is a picture of a concert. So in these camps, what these folks did was they began to organize their own society within the camp. What's interesting about this is you got old glory up here. You go down the flagpole. Here are American citizens who are in an internment camp. What have they done? They have organized an orchestra from among the folks in the camp that are able to play instruments and they begin to put concerts on for themselves. So, okay, let's do this on a Saturday night. No fun being in the camp, but you know what? We can have some fun on a Saturday night by having uh, concerts for ourselves. Here is a picture of a school. Um, so they set up a school, right? Hey, we're not gonna let our little kids fall behind in their education. We're going to, we have some Japanese American teachers that are interned here. All right, let's get going here, okay? Let's, um, let's get these folks, uh, you know, keeping up with their studies so that we don't have them fall behind um, as well. Now, Mrs. Roosevelt spoke out against this. She did not think this, this 
uh, internment was a, was a good idea. <clears throat> and she said, you know, this is not something we should be doing. And President Roosevelt basically told her to butt out, right? That, listen, you know, there's too much going on right now. I can't be hearing this. I can't have you talking about this. I can't have you undermining, uh, you know, uh, American, uh, you know, military policy here. So I don't want you, you know, talking about this. I don't want you, you know, in the newspapers about this. And Mrs. Roosevelt was not happy about that. But in classic Mrs. Roosevelt, um, uh, uh, you know, fashion, she said, okay, I won't get in the newspapers about it. I won't get on the radio about it. But she did go and visit the camps. And so, you know, she would go and visit with these folks. Here she is visiting with one of the camps and basically saying, look, guys, I hear you, man. I know what you're up against. I know what's going on here. I don't like it any more than you do. You know, bear with us, see what, you know, can happen here, see what we can do. And, you know, we'll make the best of it. In fact, she um, was very instrumental in if you were a, a school age, uh, let's say kid that was getting ready to like, graduate high school and go to college, um, she helped to get uh, these kids deferments so they could go to universities and colleges um, in the, um, on the East Coast of the United States where there was far less Japanese American sentiment. You know, you couldn't go back to your hometown in, on the West Coast because of course, you know, there was all this hysteria uh, ginned up against you um, as well. Here is a Japanese uh, family. You got your uh, mom, you got your dad, you got the, the uh, baby brother. And where is older brother? Older brother is fighting in the United States uh, Army. And uh, there were a, a large number of these folks who joined the military once they were, you know, uh, sort of proven not to be, uh, you know, a, a sleeper cell or anything like that. And these guys served primarily in the Mediterranean. Their units would sometimes receive 300% casualties because they felt above and beyond the call of ordinary soldiership that they needed to um, prove that they were willing to fight uh, for the country. So while their parents are watching the progress of the war from inside these camps behind uh, barbed wire, um, these guys are out there spilling their blood defending America and trying to defeat Hitler um, and trying to, um, you know, defeat uh, the Axis, um, the Axis powers. Um, there was something I was just going to say and it went right out of my head. Um, oh, so were these camps um, nice? No, not really. Um, but your students are going to say, well, isn't this just as bad as when the, the, the Germans put everybody in concentration camps? Um, yes and no. It was as bad in the sense of one week you're living in your life and you're living in your house and you've got everything going on and you're, you know, everything's fine and dandy. And then the next week you're living in a, basically a barrack out in the middle of a desert um, or along a swamp or at an old fairground. Um, in that sense, yes, it's not a good thing. But these were not camps where people were tortured. These were not camps where people were forced to work. These were not camps where people were killed. Um, they were detained. Their rights as everyday American citizens like you and me could go to the movies, you know, do whatever we want to do, were taken away. However, um, they were not, um, you know, along the same lines as certainly not the Nazi death camps and um, certainly not the, um, you know, level of of the, um, you know, the, the, the labor camps and such that the Nazis uh, had, had put together. As the hysteria after Pearl Harbor died down, conditions in the camps got better. Folks were still there, but they got better. Um, they were able to get furloughs to leave the camp and go and work in local towns, but they had to return back uh, at night. They um, were able to order things from the Sears catalog. Uh, they were able to order, um, uh, you know, like carpeting, you know, carpets, uh, Victrolas, those sorts of things. Um, if they were able to, uh, to afford to do that, they could order these things. Many of them set up gardens uh, outside of the, um, um, you know, the, the barracks so that they could supplement the food that the government was giving them. Um, you know, so rather than just have the regular rations that were coming through, you know, uh, grandpa's going to grow some tomatoes and grandma's going to grow some cucumbers so we can trade that with the family down the street, you know, or down the, you know, the other barrack who's growing lettuce and we can, you know, create a salad and those sorts of things um, for us 
um, as, um, as well. So um, what happened with these folks was they, uh, the average stay was about three and a half years in these camps. Um, and conditions did get better, but they were not, you know, released. Many of the folks stayed in the camps even after the war was over, sometimes for as long as a year. And the reason for that was because that had become their new home, right? Where were they going to go? They were going to go back to the business that they used to have, that they had a sale that somebody else took over. They were going to go back to the house that they used to have that was sold out from under them. Uh, they were going to go back to these neighborhoods where, you know, um, and, and face the neighbors that, you know, had basically, you know, helped them, you know, get packed up and move out. So a lot of these folks were looking for new places to resettle. They resettled in the East. They resettled um, along the uh, upper, you know, around the Chicago area, um, those sorts of places, um, because they weren't, Welcome. They didn't feel welcome, and they didn't feel there was anything to go back to um, on the uh, on the West Coast. Now, what are the lessons that we learned from this? Well, I'm glad you asked, and then we'll open it up to some Q and A. The lessons that we learned from this is that it shows just how delicate our rights are, and in fact, in a national crisis, the first thing you need to keep an eyeball on is your civil rights, okay? Because the mass hysteria that occurred as a result of the attack at Pearl Harbor, the uh, hate speak and the ginning up of anti-Asian sentiment on the West Coast by the politicians created an environment under which these kinds of conditions were ripe. FDR never said, go round up Japanese Americans and put them into camps. He said you can create exclusion zones. An unintended consequence of that executive order, which is undeniable, was that these folks were rounded up and put into camps. Could FDR have issued another executive order and said, no, that's not what I meant? You know, what I meant was, yes, he could have. Did he? No. Why? It's up to a lot of speculation. Basically, um, it was um, two, you can boil it down to two basic things. Number one was a lack of leadership right, because he just didn't feel he should stand up or could stand up to uh, the, the pol political pressure he was feeling from the West Coast. He also didn't feel he could stand, stand up to the um, military pressure that he was feeling uh, from the military. So it was a lack of, of leadership on his, uh, on his, um, his part. And it was, uh, you know, basically no way around it, you know, racism, right? You know, these folks were wrapped, uh, were rounded up and, and put off into these, these camps because of what they looked like, uh, because they um, looked different, because they were Japanese ancestry. You know, this was the country that attacked us. Uh, there were some camps for, um, for Germans, there were some camps for Italians, um, but nothing, nothing on the scale of as the Japanese Americans. 120,000 red-blooded Americans rounded up, taken off, put in these camps. They stayed there three and a half years. And then when the war was over, okay, return to your life. It wasn't until the, uh, the Carter administration uh, that they uh, actually forward that they said, all right, let's look, the government said, let's look into what happened here. Then the Carter administration carried that on because Ford was only president for two years. And then they decided they were going to do something about this. Uh, Ronald Reagan made the apology. They were given $20,000, uh, each person that was in a camp, uh, you know, as their, their restitution for this. Uh, and they got a government apology. Some of those people did not receive their checks until the end of the first Bush administration. So it was an incredibly long and drawn out uh, process. So the lessons we can learn from this is that there can be unintended consequences from actions that are taken by the government, that um, there is a, a very fine line between your civil rights and national emergencies once this hysteria begins to, uh, to kick in. And it also shows um, the, uh, the power to perform acts for, for public good, right? So these Japanese Americans didn't, you know, there was only a couple of, of cases that were, where they were tried in court. And in both cases, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the government. Um, it wasn't until later on that, you know, the real movement began. And um, these folks, these Japanese Americans felt, if this is what our government needs us to do, this is what we'll do. So I, I love this part of history from the standpoint of there are so many pertinent 
uh, lessons we can learn for our own current time in history. But I hate this time in history because things just went so bad. There was never uh, a case of a, of a Japanese American who was uh, found to be involved in, in any kind of sabotage or any kind of espionage uh, you know, during this, this time frame. And in fact, one of the, the key folks who led the advance for this on the West Coast was a guy by the name of Earl Warren, who was working his way up through the legal systems and the political systems out there. He was uh, attorney general for the state of California, uh, and he was actively involved in some of this ginning up of the anti Asian sentiment. He later becomes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he rules over one of the most liberal courts uh, in uh, you know, jurisprudence history. Some people say he did that because he was feeling the guilt of what he had done earlier in his career and was looking to um, turn that back. So that's what I want to talk to you about in, in terms of this. It shows the delicate balance of our civil rights. We saw this again after 9-11, um, where suddenly you know, the Patriot Act was passed and there was no longer you know, uh, French fries, there was freedom fries and you know, all this kind of crazy hysteria. If you don't think it can happen, you're wrong. It can happen. And you know, a lot of times it, you don't realize uh, what the, the, the trigger is going to be that sets this over the point where it's just being ginned up to the point where it's actually implemented. So you need to be very careful about that. Let's go to some, some Q&A here. Let's see. Go back to uh, some of this here. Da -de -da -de -da. Let's see. OK. Um, yeah, restrooms, bathhouses were terrible because they did not have uh, any type of, of privacy there either. No, it was, it was very stark, very, um, you know, very, um, uh, basic, you know, it, it, especially initially. Eventually, uh, it did get better, but you're still living in a barrack with, you know, 10,000 other people uh, around you. Uh, we did a project on Japanese American internment. This site is a high school. Oh, good, very nice. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Eagles uh, of Heart Mountain, if you're interested, right? Excellent. A lot of research is in this. Yes. Keep in mind also that these, these pictures that I'm showing you that uh, of, of inside the camp were taken by, oh, who? Oh yeah, uh, government photographers, right? So, um, you know, there's a little element of, you gotta take that with a grain of salt there um, as well. Uh, Jack's, uh, right, Robert Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, which also has the I Love Lucy Museum there. And it's awesome if you go, uh, check out both of those things. Um, yes, Jeremy Sodato, yep. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt wanted to bring a Japanese American family from one of the camps to live in the White House, but FDR told her the Secret Service would not allow it. Yeah, it was, you know, we, we weren't gonna take any chances. We couldn't take any chances. Again, please be aware, I'm not saying this by way of excuses. I'm simply putting it in the context of what the folks were, were understanding at the time. Remember, history must be viewed in the time of the people that are living it. Um, but what scares the living bejeebies out of me is that it doesn't take a big jump to go from what's happening now or what's happened recently to what happened uh, in um, you know, the Japanese American internment. So keep, a, so keep, a, um, keep an eye on, on that. Uh, were Japanese Americans made uh, to pay for any essentials? No, basically they were, um, they were given what they needed, uh, you know, bare minimum of what they needed. Um, there was an economy of course that developed within uh, the camps and such. Um, and you know, they were able to, um, you know, access money and then, you know, um, you know, uh, buy stuff uh, outside of the camps through the Sears catalog and also trade and barter uh, within the camp um, as, uh, as well. Bank accounts were generally safe, um, you know, because they weren't hugely, um, there wasn't a huge lot of money in there. It wasn't like you could go freeze, you know, $50 million worth of, uh, of money uh, there as well. And what a lot of these folks did was they turned to trusted friends in the community who look, no, look, you know, hey, Mark, I've lived across the street from you for 30 years. You know, I'm no threat to America. Um, and so, you know, here, I'm going to give you my cat. Take care of my kitty cat while I'm gone. Um, this is my grandma's piano. I can't find somebody to buy it in a week. Here, can you put it in your basement? Um, you know, can you take care of my, uh, some of these accounts for me, some of these, these things? Uh, and that's what uh, folks did. 
Um, and sometimes they were able to go back and recover some of this stuff. Very often the business was gone, the house was gone. Somebody asked a question there, Jeff, about whether subject to the draft and I, and I answered it for you only because we had a History Day student this year that actually focused on resistance to the draft by Japanese Americans in the camps, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, and which is what I put the link to earlier right. in the chat. Fascinating <laughs> topic because the, the, the population within the camps were split themselves over the issue. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's kind of a nuance there. You know, on the one hand, you're being put in the camps because you're not trustworthy, but we're trusting you enough to draft you into the military. Right. And so there was these conflicting opinions about whether or we are Americans or not, and we're right. expected to fight under the flag. And so there was some resistance, but those men that were resisted, many of them were vilified by their own Japanese Americans within the camps. Exactly. So it's a really fascinating topic that you could dig into multiple perspectives of. And at one point, the government offered them to take a loyalty oath. Do you take a loyalty oath to the United right. States? And you know, disavow your any Japanese, um, you know, citizenship. Then you know, we'll we'll think more kindly about letting you out of the camp and such. And of course, the resistance to that was, how come I have to take a loyalty oath? You know, you don't birth a baby here in America and make them put their hand on a diaper and you know, and raise their right hand and vow to be good Americans. No other American that's naturally born here has to take a loyalty oath. Why should I? And so what happened was, this was a bit of a trap. Because, um, and, the, and again, it was one of these things with the Justice Department, because if you disavow your, your citizenship to Japan, you know, um, then basically, uh, you know, and, and you weren't really considered an American citizen, you know, you could give up your citizenship, you could become a person with no country. And here is a picture of these guys, you know, taking this loyalty oath. And some of them took it, uh, again, with this idea of, all right, you know, that's what you need me to do, that's what I'll do. Some of them refused to take it because it's like, why should I take a, a loyalty oath? Nobody else has to. And the minute, guess what happened? The minute you refuse to take that loyalty oath, aha, so you're not loyal to America, eh? So you were damned if you did and you damned if you didn't. And some of those were not really reconciled until the 1990s and 2000s within the Japanese American community. It's a yeah. really sad story. Absolutely, absolutely. This thing lasted well beyond the three and a half years these guys and gals were in the camps. You know, um, we didn't even start thinking about being, you know, going back and looking at this until uh, President Ford, right, in 1970. Uh, any of this mentioned during the campaign? No, there wasn't. Uh, there wasn't anything mentioned about that uh, during the campaign um, because uh, basically we were in the war at that point, and it was all, you know, um, you know, steam full speed ahead for for getting through this. This kind of thing, you know, and don't forget, there wasn't a lot of of, um, uh, of sympathy for for these Japanese folks, right? If there had been, they they you know somebody would have stood up and said, no, this is not what the executive order meant, you know, and it would have been able to come up at that point. Yeah, you can look at Dr. Seuss's propaganda posters for a reflection of anti-Japanese sentiment. Yeah, um, I also I don't even have one. I had one here. Uh, at one point, but I, there was a, they put out a Japanese hunting license, somebody put out, not the government, but somebody just put out a Japanese hunting license. And it was this idea of, you know, you can, you know, you could go hunt a Japanese person just like you could a deer, you know, um, and that's the kind of visceral, there was uh, sheet music, anti-Japanese sheet music. Um, this was discovered, this is a, what they called a, a, a a balloon bomb. The Japanese uh, were sending bom bom um, bombs attached to balloons across the Pacific Ocean on the, the jet stream. And the idea of this was to start um, uh, forest fires on the West Coast and draw away uh, resources that could be used for the military. Um, and this was seen as, see how sneaky these people are? First Pearl Harbor, now this, who knows what they're capable of? And again, all this hysteria being ginned up um, you know, against these, these Americans. Thank you so much, Jeff. We're right at three. And Jeff will be joining us again in the morning uh, for his final presentation. So I'm sure he wouldn't mind continuing the discussion then. I'm cognizant of time mm -hmm. as it's four o'clock on the East Coast and three o'clock Central, <laughs> just for Jeff's purposes there in New York. We appreciate it. He's got his clock right there. 
we're going to sign right off and I hope I don't feel like I'm being 